CVD, or Chemical Vapor Deposition. We continue the lecture on deposition. In the last, uh, not in the last, in one of the lectures before, we discussed oxidation as a way to deposit, to, to grow oxides. But if you, if you look at, this is a structure of an advanced uh, device. This is an NMOS transistor in the Intel Prescott. I took it from the website. And we emphasize the position, on, we talk about epitaxial silicon, uh, polycrystalline silicon, LPCVD silicon nitride, LPCVD silicon dioxide. And if you look at the dimension, the dimension, this is the transistor. If you look very carefully, you see here this region, this is, this region and this region are the contacts to the source and drain. Here you see the gate, it says here nickel silicide. And here, this area are the spacers, and I'm going to discuss later about the structure. But again, this structure is a source and drain. This is the lightly doped drain, the LDD, and this is the gate. And here, on the device, you see a layer of silicon nitride. Silicon nitride, SI3N4, is an insulator. It's a very good insulator with, a very, with some very good properties. For example, silicon nitride is an ideal, the best barrier for dopants. It's an excellent barrier. It has another property. It has very high intrinsic stress. And I will talk a little bit about stress. This material, silicon nitride, when you deposit it, it has a very strong internal stress, S being deposited. So when you deposit the sin, the stress nitride on top of the structure, you generate a stress also in the semiconductor. And people found out that by applying on NMOS devices a stress, you improve the mobility in the silicon. The silicon is a semiconductor. And if you remember, the mobility of the device depends on the band structure. And so it goes that if you apply a, ten, a stress on the semiconductor, on silicon, and I will, in, not in, in one of the, in lecture number 12, I believe, we will discuss the physics of this phenomena. But generally speaking, when you apply stress, you change the band structure of the semiconductor, and you improve the mobility in NMOS devices. The PMOS device is done slightly differently here. You put here, this is again the source and the drain, but here you put an epitaxial silicon germanium. And the lecture today is to explain to you what is epitaxial, what is CVD silicon nitride, what is, here you, here you have, by the way, this is the contact and it's made of tungsten. And tungsten is a metal which is used as a contact to the semiconductor. And the metal of the tungsten, the tungsten as the metal, is, deposit, is deposited by chemical vapor deposition. This is, in this device, this is a PMOS device, the source and the drain, and here is the semiconductor in the middle. And this is the gate, the gate is polysilicon, and on top of it nickel silicide. The polysilicon is being deposited by chemical vapor deposition. The silicon germanium is deposited by a special chemical uh, vapor deposition, which is called epitaxial growth. And I will tell you what is regular CVD, what is epitaxial growth. They are both deposition from the gas phase, but epitaxial growth is when you grow a semiconductor, an ordered semiconductor. Now, silicon germanium has one property. Germanium is a larger atom than silicon. And the lattice constant of, constant of silicon, of the uh, unit cell in the lattice of the semiconductor is larger. So when you put a silicon germanium in silicon, you apply force. You want, you, the silicon germanium wants to occupy more space. So what happens, you apply stress on this region, and here you have a compressive stress. Here, the stress is coming from both sides, and both sides are pushing the center. In this structure, actually this has a very high stress, but it, it wants 
to open this structure. So here you have a tensile stress, stress to the outside, and in this area you have a stress to the inside. And this also increases the mobility of holes in semiconductor. And you can increase the mobility by a factor of 3 or 4 or 5 even. So you can get much faster devices. So this is a structure of modern devices. This is typical 45 nanometer device. More advanced devices are even you replace the nickel. The, the, this is a polysilicon gate. You replace the gate with complete metal. So if you, if you discuss nanostructures, a nano 32 nanometer and maybe the future 22 nanometer devices, you will replace the polysilicon gate with a metal gate, complete metal gate. And here you have a very thin oxide Today, or in the past, the oxide was grown by oxidation. However, in modern devices, although the gate is, the, the gate is also deposited by chemical vapor deposition, and the gate is made of hafnium oxide or components of hafnium oxide or hafnium oxosilicide, in, to summarize, this is front-end CMOS thin films. You have here tungsten CVD, silicon nitride CVD, polysilicon CVD. In the PMOS, you have epitaxial silicon germanium also deposited by CVD. So today we are going to study CVD. Now, sorry. There are many CVD processes. The general, it's a very general term. CVD, or chemical vapor deposition, is, a, is, every, is, is a, any deposition process where the deposition is from the gas phase. This is the general term. By a chemical process. In the next week, we are going to discuss physical vapor deposition when the atoms are coming from the vacuum, but not by chemical process, by a completely physical process. Now, you can have the process in atmospheric pressure. Then we call it APCVD, atmospheric pressure chemical vapor deposition. You perform the deposition process in atmospheric pressure. Now, in atmospheric pressure, we have a, a lot of atoms in the gas per unit volume, so we can expect high deposition rate. However, you have to understand that deposition rate is not just reaction in the gas phase. On the opposite, we don't want reaction in the gas phase. The reaction can take on the gas phase or on the surface. If the reaction is on the gas phase, we call it homogeneous reaction. If it's on the surface, we call it heterogeneous reaction. We want the reaction to be only on the surface. Because if for some reason we have reaction in the volume, we will generate particles, and the particles will deposit on the surface, and we'll get, it's not a good idea. We generate a lot of particles. We don't want to generate particles. We want the reaction to happen only on the surface of the semiconductor, or the oxide, or the nitrite, or the tungsten. So you, you want, for example, to grow polysilicon. Polysilicon is being deposited from a gas called silen, SiH4. You bring the gas into the chamber, heat it, and you want the reaction to be on, only on the surface. So you have to take the atom from the gas phase. They have to be transported to the surface. They have to be absorbed at the surface. Maybe you got some surface diffusion, and then you have the reaction. If you don't have the reaction, you will have a desorption. So what we are going to do today is to model or to understand the mechanisms of chemical vapor deposition and the physics behind the chemistry of deposition. Now, the reactor can be hot wall or a cold wall. It's two type of reactors. You can have reactors when you take a chamber and heat it from everywhere from the outside. So we call it a hot wall. Like everything is hot. Or... You can take a reactor where only you heat only the wafer, and the chamber is relatively colder. We call it a cold wall. 
Now, APCVD reacts, reactors were, uh, I would say, the first reactors that had been introduced because they're simple to build and you don't, have to, you don't need to generate a vacuum. So you just push the gas in, pump the gas out, and everything is simple. However, this, we are going to discuss it. This type of reactors have some very fundamental problems especially when you want to deposit layers on very, very small features. If you want to use chemical vapor deposition to generate micro and nanostructures, you need to go to low pressure CVD, LPCVD, because you need to bring the atoms into the chamber, into the structure without collision with other atoms. And if you have a lot of atoms in the volume, a lot of molecules in the volume, they collide. And you have, if you want to build a structure, if you want to bring the atoms moving directly into your nanostructure without colliding with other atoms, you need to pump down to lower the pressure in the chamber so the mean free path between collisions will be larger than the size of your pattern. And this is why people use LPCVD, low pressure CVD. Again, you can have hot wall or cold wall. And by just lowering the pressure, we get better deposition on micro and nanostructures. And I'm going to describe again the physics behind this phenomena. I'm just telling you the, f the fact now, but we are going to describe the physics of it. Questions? Actually, not. And I'm going to describe because the reaction is a two-step reaction or a multi-step reaction. And the reaction is dominated by the step which is the slowest. And so it happens that you design the reaction or most of the reaction you design them, you have the time it takes for the molecule to be transported to the surface and the time it takes it to react on the surface. And I'm going to show you later that when you go to high vacuum, you have less molecules in the volume. But because the mean free path now is longer, the diffusion from the volume to the surface is faster. So overall, the deposition rate is slightly slower. But it's, if, you reduce the, 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 if you reduce the pressure by a factor of 1,000 or 10,000, the deposition rate is not going down by a factor of 10,000 and maybe by a factor of 3 or 4 or 5 or 10. So it's, and you get much better deposition because you have less molecule in the, in the volume, but they transport much faster. But if you want, following, it was a very good question, because let's say if the rate is not good enough, what you do? You want to accelerate it. How do you accelerate it? You, instead of dealing with atoms, with neutral, you apply a very strong electric field, and you ionize the atoms, and you generate plasma. And because now you don't have atoms, you have reactive species, not just atoms, but the, the atoms are excited. They have higher energy, so they react much faster. We call it PCVD, or plasma-enhanced CVD, or you can heat the chamber in a very high temperature for a very short time, because increasing the temperature increases the deposition rate. So you can have PCVD or RTCVD, and either hot wall and cold wall. RTCVD is always cold wall. People, it's impossible to make a hot wall system with RTCVD because hot wall systems are very big. They have a very huge uh, thermal mass. So uh, you want very difficult to heat large systems. So RTCVD are always cold wall. Now, um, recently some systems uh, compromise instead of doing atmospheric pressure or LPCVD, they do what's called subatmospheric CVD. It's a generation which is, it's just, an, a, I would say, it's a terminology. It's still low pressure. But what people are doing in some applications, you want very high deposition rate and you don't care very much about the quality or the, the very fine patterns, like if you want to deposit for solar cells. So cost is a big problem. So you increase the pressure, you got uh, subatmospheric CVD, you got 
good transport and better deposition with some problems for nanostructures, but for solar cells you don't care for nanostructures. I'm, yes, and I'm going to show you some exactly how to tailor it. Now you have few, in CVD in general, you have few reaction types. This is what we call pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is a typical reaction where you, by heat, you break the molecule, and what's left is being deposited, and the rest goes away. For example, SiH4, silen is a molecule which is a gas at room temperature and when you heat it up and by the way it's a pyrophoric it's a pyrophoric gas Py do you know what's a pyrophoric pyrophoric gas is a gas that when you it, it uh, self uh, it ignites itself in air if you open this bottle in air and please don't do it but if you open it in air it will, it will shoot a flame of fire from the bottle because once this gas uh, rea uh, comes in contact with air, it reacts with the oxygen immediately. It's a ex very exothermic reaction. But if you take this gas and inject it to a chamber without oxygen, so it's a stable gas, but if you heat it up to 550 degrees Celsius, for example, you break it. And, the temp and what's happening usually, uh, and people actually investigated it, the process of breakage or the breaking process of uh, silen is a two-step process. First, you generate SiH2 plus hydrogen, and then you generate ice, a silicon plus hydrogen, and the silicon simply is deposited on the surface. I'm showing you this as an example and to understand the typical chemical vapor deposition, if you want to model it correctly, you have to understand not what in the beginning and what in the end, you have to understand each one of the steps. Because you have a reaction rate between here and here. A reaction rate between here and here. And what determines the deposition rate is the reaction which is the slowest. Always you have the rate determining step is the rate which is the slowest. So this is pyrolysis. You can have oxidation. If you take this molecule SiH4 and inject to the chamber a small amount of oxygen. If you inject too much oxygen you will have homogeneous reaction and everything in the volume will be immediately will generate dust particles all over. But if you inject a relatively small amount of oxygen to the chamber and you heat your wafer, silen will be attached to the surface, oxygen will be attached to the surface, and they react on the surface because they react, the surface is hot and the gas is relatively cold. So the reaction will be only on the surface. And then you will deposit SiO2, and this is CVD of SiO2, and other glasses, by the way, you can deposit titanium oxide and other gases. Uh, many oxides are being deposited. Uh, for example, you can take SiH4 plus oxygen and 450, you generate SiO2 plus hydrogen. You can, for example, inject in addition to silicon, you can inject a gas called phosphine, PH3. Uh, by the way, this gas is extremely toxic. It's very toxic. It's a very not friendly gas. And you oxidize it, then you gener generate P2O5. So imagine that you have like a shower of molecules going on the surface. Partly are SiO2 and partly are P2O5. So you will generate a glass which is a mixture between SiO2, which is a glass, and P2O5, which is another glass. This is called phosphorsilica glass. Uh, glasses, uh, SiO2 is the uh, silicon based glass, but you can mix SiO2 with many other oxides and many, uh, many other metals and many other uh, glass forming materials like phosphorus, boron. Uh, if you look at other glasses at your home, like Pyrex, and you, in, you introduce other metals to the glass. But the, 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 advantage of, the advantage of using this type of glass is to reduce the glass temperature of the glass. 
uh, SIO, uh, SIO2 has a glass temperature above 900 degrees Celsius. P2O5 P2O5 has a glass temperature which is much lower. So if you mix P2O5 and SiO2, you generate a glass which melts, can uh, not melt, but flow uh, in a temperature less than 800 degrees Celsius. Question? Uh, does the oxidation consume silicon from the substrate? No. No, because we do it at 450 degrees Celsius. Because, it's a good question, if... I will take this process and run it at 900 degrees Celsius or 1000 degrees, 1000 degrees Celsius, then I will also, in addition to this process, I will have oxidation of the surface. But because we do it here at 450 degrees Celsius, the oxidation reaction is too slow. And this is the advantage of this process, that you can deposit oxide at much lower temperature than, than uh, thermal oxidation. And for example, this is very useful when you want to isolate aluminum, for example, because aluminum melts at about 660 degrees Celsius. So let's say you want to deposit SiO2 over aluminum for, insulate, for insulation. So you can use this process. And this is, this is actually this is what people use for many, many years to, um, to protect uh, uh, aluminum. Another process which is very useful is called reduction. Instead of oxidation, you can reduce. For example, uh, tungsten, the position of tungsten, LPCVD, low pressure chemical vapor deposition of tungsten, which is the major process today for contacts for VLSI, is done by the reduction of a molecule which is called WF6. Tungsten with six fluorides, if you heat it up in the presence of hydrogen, you mix WF6 and hydrogen and you heat them at 400 degrees Celsius, you reduce this metal and you generate this um, atomic tungsten, NHF. Now, you have to be very careful because this is, very, this is HF at 400 degrees Celsius, it's very active, so you have to pump it out very quickly. And one of the reliability problems in this process is that we see sometimes some uh, defects or etching of some of the places, some of the sites, because of some uh, improper treatment of this HF. However, uh, people now manage to solve this problem. It's, not a, it, it's a problem if you don't design the system well, if the system, is, if the system is not well designed. If the system is well designed and you have the reaction on the surface and you pump away all the products, then you are okay. And don't forget, this is HF in a gas phase, and there is no water here. There is no, it's, this is not a acid in an uh, electrolyte solution. This is just dry HF. But still, it's a very, a very aggressive material. And um, this is a reaction of halides. And, and, and another comment, by the way, many metals and many semiconductors uh, have uh, uh, halides, which halides is a compound with chlorine or bromine or fluorine or iodine, which are volatile, which are in a gas phase. Uh, silicon, silicon chloride, silicon tetrachloride, silicon iodide, tetra iodine, and tungsten fluoride, tungsten with other uh, halides, and many, many metals are actually in a gas phase uh, their, their compound with halides is a gas. Many metals, but not copper. Copper halide is not gas, which is a big problem. Uh, you can also have another reduction. Uh, for example, what happens if you react WF6 with SiH4? And this reaction in 250 degrees Celsius also generates tungsten, and another compound which is SiF4, but SiF4 is a gas which is going out. And WF6 with 2SiF4 can generate also this. So you have a few possible reactions, and actually these reactions can go in parallel. And sometimes if you model the system, you can sometimes have few reactions going in parallel, so the modeling is, can be complicated. Uh, uh, sorry? 
Uh, which which this one? This one, this one. But uh, let's, uh, it's a good question because you can find different processes in different companies and different tools. It's not that everybody is using exactly the same. Uh, this reaction has some advantages. It's more selective. Uh, it's, I will t tell you a little bit about. Uh, okay, I will t tell you a little bit later about. Uh, in order for this, okay, this is this is the reaction, and this is another reaction. But some the, don't forget the reaction occurs on the surface. The surface. You, in the surface, imagine the following, and I'm going to show in details later, but imagine the WF6 arrives to the surface, SIH4 arrives to the surface, surface, they absorb, and then they meet, and then they react on the surface. The reaction can be a multi-step also. Or, here, it's hydrogen molecule on the surface, because the WF6 is in the gas phase, and then it reaches the surface, and then it's traveling on the surface by surface diffusion. Hydrogen is reaching the surface, and when they meet, they react on the surface. Because of are surface reactions. Remember, I design the system not to have reaction in the volume. I, I try to avoid reaction in the volume. Because if I have reaction in the volume, then I can generate particles, and then I have a big problem of controllability of the process. Also, when you deposit on the surface, you can have very smooth and high quality a coverage because all the atoms and the molecules are one by one accumulated and you can have very uniform structure. Now, what I did not mention that it's possible to have some catalytic effect. Now remember what is catalysis? Catalysis means that some component on the surface accelerates the deposition. For example, presence of silicon on the surface may have another effect on the reaction itself, not only the reaction, but in, for a very short time we have silicon on the surface, we can have some catalysis effect. And I'm going to touch this point later. But I would like to review now the methods. You asked me what questions, what people are using now. Uh, you can find both processes in manufacturing today. Now, silicon nitride is, is another a very common material, and it's a compound formation. Here it's not oxidation, not reaction, just a compound, just a reaction when you generate a compound. SiH4, silane with ammonia, and this is typically at higher temperature. This reaction, if you want to get some re results, you have to do it at higher temperature. And if you grow it at 800, you will have this reaction, at 700 probably you prefer to use silicon uh, dichlorosilan. This is Si chlorine 2H2. It's more common. And this reaction, first, it occurs at lower temperature. Second, you generate a little bit of HCl, uh, which has a self cleaning uh, mechanism on your system. However, it also has some uh, corrosion effect on the furnace. And you have to be very careful because you are generating HCl in all the components after. You have, the, you have HCl in the pump, HCl in the pipes. You are not allowed to eject it to the air. You have to treat it before you get rid of it. And if for some reason there is some humidity in your lines, you will generate acid and then you will have corrosion to the metal pipes. It's... It's a problem, but it's a very common process because it generates very high quality silicon nitride. Now, if you want to accelerate the process, you add some electric field and you generate plasma. And if you generate plasma, this reaction will not be at 800. You can make it happen at 200 or 300 degrees Celsius. What else? CBD of titanium nitride. Titanium nitride, TIN, is a very, very common material. It's an excellent conductor. This is titanium nitride. Titanium nitride. It's a nitride of titanium, TIN. TIN is a very common material in aluminum-based technology. So people use it a lot in memory applications because uh, many companies are still using aluminum technology for memories. Uh, in 
copper metallization, people use more than tantalum nitride, which is another compound, also a nitride of tantalum. If you, by the way, if you look at the common materials that we use, we use metals and we use their oxide or nitrides. We use, for example, titanium or tungsten or copper, but we also use titanium nitride, tantalum nitride, or titanium oxide, aluminum oxide. Alum the, those materials are, can be deposited very easily and usually have very high quality and with a lot of good properties. For example, titanium nitride, which is a very common material, and it's used in aluminum metallization as a barrier. And if you remember, when we discussed lithography, I mentioned that if you have aluminum, this is aluminum. Aluminum is very shiny. So if you put photoresist on top of it, and if you illuminate it, you will have a standing wave of the photoresist. So you put on the surface of the aluminum a very thin layer of anti-reflective coating. And titanium nitride is very common because titanium nitride, the color of titanium nitride is gold, which means it absorbs blue. You know, I told you when, if you look at gold, gold, you know that gold absorbs blue very well because gold looks gold. It reflects red, which means it absorbs blue. Same as copper. So you put here titanium nitride, and as a bonus, titanium nitride also has a, is a barrier layer because titanium nitride uh, blocks the diffusion of uh, atoms into the oxide. It's a very uh, also stabilizes the surface, so it's very common in aluminum technology. Everything here is thin film. Everything I just, every, uh, this lecture is about thin film. I'm not talking about thick film technology. It's a completely different topic. Completely different topic. Can you see it for hours? Still, you call it thin film technology. Because thick film technology is another technology. Thick film technology, if you're not familiar, is based on paste. You mix, let's say you want to deposit silver or titanium oxide. So you take a paste, like an organic material or ceramic material or and you mix it with the powder of whatever, and then you fire it. And then you can generate a thick layer of your metal. Thick film technology is a different technology. and It's not relevant to this class. It's used uh, for other applications. It's, uh, it's definitely not for nanotechnology. Uh, the only advantage of it is very cheap. It makes very poor conductor, and the contact is bad, but it's extremely cheap technology because you just spray it and burn it, and you have it. So people use it for like capacitors for high-frequency applications. You find it in many applications, but this class is about thin film technology. Everything we do here is micro and nanoscale. You can deposit it for a long time, yes, and sometimes we do it. We... Sometimes we do, we, for example, we use a thin film technology to deposit uh, like 50 microns of metal, but still we call it thin film technology. So you can have titanium chlorophore, for example, and hydrogen. This is a reduction reaction. You generate nitride in atmospheric pressure. Or you take it with ammonia at 600 at low pressure and you generate Ti nitride. Or you take this compound, Ti N CH3 N4, which is metal organic compound. It's D can you can you figure out the name of this? Are you a chemist in the house? Can you figure out the name of this molecule? Okay. I will be very glad to give you the name later, but this is an organic molecule. And this organic molecule, when you heat, when you heat it up, it generates Ti nitride, but because of the carbon, it, it, it has a little bit of carbon. And this process is called metal organic CVD, MOCVD. And, or mix it with ammonia at 300 degrees Celsius, then you got Ti nitride. Don't, you don't need to remember all the names, but this is, for example, and, how do I say, there are many ways to, a thousand and one way to skin a cat. There's many ways to deposit titanium nitride. This is just a short list of few possible methods. 
Now you have, uh, for example, if you want to accelerate this process, you apply plasma, and there are many ways to apply plasma. One is you apply the plasma, you apply the field directly on the reaction site, or you can apply the reaction here, generate a plasma, and then you pump it so the ions are moving, and you got the deposition here. This is called remote plasma, when you ignite the plasma in one place and you let it go to another place. And again, this molecule TINCH324 generates that enum nitrate. The last reaction, this is really for chemists, and some metals are very, you cannot find them in, in, in volatile form. It's very difficult to have copper compound which is volatile. Copper halides is not volatile, are not volatile. Copper oxide are not volatile. The only compounds that contain copper are metal organic copper, like this copper H fact TV, TMVS. It's a, this molecule which has this ring here and a copper plus one here connected to silicon with three metal groups here. So this compound is a very interesting compound. It's unstable. And its instability is very unique. You take two of this molecule, and then the copper plus one, uh, 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 what it happens is what we call disproportionation reaction. The copper plus one You have two molecules of copper plus one going to one copper zero and one copper two plus. Now copper zero is regular copper, and copper two plus, two plus is the normal ion of copper. So you generate this molecule plus this extra molecule and copper zero. So this reaction is called disproportionation reaction. It's being used in few, in few metals, which is very difficult, to, very difficult to deposit them by any other method. This is just one example. There are many other examples for this disproportionation reaction. It's common. It's not so rare. And it's used for deposition of copper for CVD. It's a, it gives very high quality copper. Uh, the biggest problem of this process now, this material is very expensive. It's very expensive. So people try... Uh, not to use it very much. People prefer to use electroplating, which is another method which will, uh, I'll describe in the next lecture. Sorry? Copper become liquid at 1087 degrees Celsius. It's a little bit too high. More than 1000 degrees. This is. <laughs> I wish we could, but we cannot. So, what are the general, what is CVD? I gave you some reactions, but you understand the concept. The concept is atoms are coming, and you have reaction. So what, what we have here? We have chemical vapor deposition with, chemical, with chemically reactive gases, and the synthesis reaction must be heterogeneous. The reaction occurs on the surface, not homogeneous. These reactions are to be avoided. For example, if SiH4 going to silicon and hydrogen, it, if it will be in the gas phase, you will have like a snow in the reactor. Literally like a snow, because you have particles all over the chamber. Questions? What about the remote ion plasma? This has to happen. You, right, so the reaction doesn't happen. Uh, still reaction. And, uh, part of the reaction in the surface, but the actual reaction you want it to be... Uh, it's a good the remote plasma. You can have some reaction on the, but let's put it aside. This let's let's go for the more conventional reaction types. Uh, what we can do? We can deposit insulators, oxides, nitrides, SiO2, aluminum uh, oxide, titanium oxide, tantalum oxide, or nitrides, silicon nitride, boron nitride. We can deposit semiconductor like elements, silicon, germanium. This is the way people deposit. Gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium nitride, gallium antimonide, zinc selenide, cadmium telluride, which is very, are very useful for many other applications. And uh, we can deposit conductors like metals, tungsten, moly, aluminum, chromium, copper can be deposited, or silicide, 
like compounds, like tungsten silicide, molysilicide, tisilicide, can be deposited from a gas phase. Everything can be deposited from a gas phase. The reactions, uh, all CVD reactions follow the same generic elementary processes. All the reactions I showed you before, we can explain them as follows. There's one very common, I would say, a flow of events, a flow of steps during the CVD process. The first step is introduce chemically reaction species into the reactor. We need to have a bottle with the gas and inject the gas to the chamber. Then we have diffusion of the reactants to the surface. If I have the wafer here and I inject the gas here, reactants must diffuse in the air and we have a mass transport in the gas phase. Next, once the reactants reach the surface, we have adsorption of the reactants onto the surface. Next, we have reaction at the surface to form the solid. And we have a desorption of the reaction products from the surface. We can also have diffusion of the reaction product away from the surface, because if we generate a, a pro, a, we have byproducts in the surface, they have to diffuse, to, out, to diffuse out from the surface. We have the transport of the reaction product away out of the reactor, and the final deposition rate will be determined by the slowest one of these processes, the rate limiting step. It's very simple to describe when we have a simple process, like silen, SiH4, only one molecule. But when you start, I'm going to show some more complicated processes. Sometimes you can get some uh, uh, situations which is very difficult to explain unless you really model it step by step by step. So if you look at it, the micro microscopic versus microscopic. This is the microscopic look at the chamber. This is your chamber. Here you put wafers. And he, what I put here in red, this is our uh, heating, heating elements. And this specific reactor was very, very common in epitaxial system because what you do, you put here a component made of graphite and you can buy graphite which is extremely clean. There's some type of graphite which is extremely clean, and graphite is a conductor. You know, graphite is a conductor. So if you put here coil around the conductor, and you put some RF field, radio frequency field, you will generate eddy current inside the conductor, and you heat the substrate. So this is a way to heat elements in vacuum without touching them. So you don't need wires or component heating the ch chamber. Sorry? I think that's the quantity for clocks. Yes. Then you put the wafers on this graphite form, and you flow the gas. This, this was very common in the past. Now it's less used because now we have other methods to heat in vacuum, which are, um, you don't need to put graphite in you. Today the wafers are so big, so you need some more clever systems. But this is actually very, we had it in the Technion when I was a student, and it's very easy to build such a system. You can, you can hit with light, of course. This radiation is also possible. It's also a very common method. So the gas is flowing from here to here, and here you have to put, this is the exhaust, and you put the temperature. Now, if you, this is the macroscopic uh, uh, view. If you look at the microscopic structure, see what happens. The gas is going from the vacuum, from the volume into the surface and transport, and then they are adsorbed. So we, we have adsorption of the precursor. We call this the precursor, the molecules before the reaction. Then they can diffuse on the surface, and if nothing happens, there is a certain probability of them to go away, to desorb. So you can have a desorption. However, if they hit the surface and you have a reaction here, then instead of going away, they stay and they react. And they stay and typically they will tend to react near edges and corners and ne next to other molecules 
because typically near other molecules they have a, it's a preferred site from the energy point of view. If you have If you have a molecule, the next reaction preferred to be here, the first, if you have reactions, what happens initially, you can have reactions, there are a few modes of reaction, but very common is to generate some clusters initially, or we call it nucleation sites. So you will have a nucleation island growth. And you can have some uh, byproducts during this reaction. So you also have the absorption of the reaction products. And this is called step growth. Step growth is a, co is a one common way that one molecule is traveling and then reach a step. Reach a step, reacts, and stay there. Because if you look from the energy point of view, a molecule here, you have adsorption only to the surface. A molecule here have adsorption to the surface and adsorption to this molecule. So instead of uh, so from energy point of view, you gain more energy, or the energy of this structure is more stable than a single atom. So this is a preferred site, because usually the reaction will go to places when you gain, when the energy, the, the, the change in the free energy of the system is larger. So molecules tend to agglomerate or to generate uh, nucleation sites and then start to grow. They grow and then they meet each other and this is called coalescence and then you will get the film which is growing. So the first site is nucleation, generate nuclei. And the next step is the growth when the nuclei is growing and the coalesce. Coalesce means uh, meet together, you get ripening. Like, you all do this experiment at home when you put two drops of, uh, I don't know if you ever Today we use digital therm thermometers, but in the past people used mercury thermometers. Have you seen a, a, a thermometer made of, with mercury? Have you seen the, uh, drops of mercury on the surface? If you put them together, they tend to coalesce. If you take two drops of mercury and you put them close one to another, they will generate a much larger, a larger drop. This is called coalescence, of meeting of two drops and generating a larger drop. Why? Because this is lower energy than two drops. Also with water, yes. If you... So this is process of coalescence, but this is on the surface. It's not in the free volume, it's on the surface. And you got uh, initially nucleation sites, and then I will, I will go to this later in more details. Yes? So does this limit the minimum thickness that you can get? Because you need, before it started to agglomerate, you Ideally, ideally, what you would like to have, ideally, you would like to have a structure when you have the first molecule comes here. So everything else, first we have this. To get the monolayer. And then once you get this monolayer, everything is busy. Next step will be starting another monolayer, but the next molecule will come here. This is called epitaxial growth. Epitaxial growth when you grow monolayer by monolayer and it's ordered. Or there's another technique which I'll, I'll describe later, which is called so epitaxy, epitaxial growth. And another method which is called atomic layer deposition, atomic layer deposition. Those methods are layer by layer. And there are, the minimum thickness is the monolayer. However, if I don't have this structure and I have this island growth, this will determine the minimum thickness of the layer. So to get those processes, it depends on the surface? Depends on the surface, depends on the details. If you don't, let's say, in order to have epitaxy or atomic layer deposition, you need to have some very specific uh, mechanisms which I'm going to describe later. If you don't do it, then you don't have monolayer growth and then you have I uh, nucleation and islands and uh, the overall thickness is limited. How do we create the islands? In they are generated first, the first atom is coming, then the next atom is coming, but the next atom would like to be 
Then, if there was, let's say this was this atom first. The next atom will prefer to be next to it. So the atoms, instead of being here, the atom prefers to be here. Because always, when you have neighbors, the overall energy is lower. So the atoms like to be near neighbors. So initially, you generate islands. A few molecules here, a few molecules here, but they trend to come, to diffuse and to stay one close to another. Then you generate islands. Then the islands coalesce. The islands merge, and you have this growth. So we have the gas phase reaction, the transport of the reactions to the surface, the adsorption of reactions to the surface. Then we have the chemical reaction, the absorption of the volatile products from the surface, the transport of the volatile product away from the surface. And for example, this is a repeat of what I showed you before, and just before we go to break, listen, for example, what happens if you have a system of chlorosilane system. Chlor H and silicon. This is a very common system in manufacturing today in many applications because there are many gases. For example, there is a SiH4, SiH3 chlorine, SiH2 chlorine 2, etc. And also you can have a CH4, CH. CL3, etc. So this system, you can, you can mix, there's a lot of possible combinations. And these gases are very useful. Each one of them can be used to deposit oxide or to deposit sil silicon or to deposit other materials. And you can have a combination of them. So you can have, for example, in the chlorosilan system, you can have H2 and HCl or HCH4 and these components. In the gas phase, you can have these components going to this component. In the surface, for example, in the gas phase, you can have the silicon dichlorosilane going to SIL chlorine 2 and H2, and on the surface, uh, SI chlorine 2 H2 going to silicon plus HCl adsorbed. So if, if I summarize, and this is the last slide before we go to break, one, transport to the surface, then we have transport on the surface, reaction, formation, and if we have some byproducts that are coming out, and this is what we are going to do in the next lecture, to go and to study this typical reaction and to try to build a model for common reactions. So now it's uh, 6.10, we are going for 10 minutes break. To summarize, these are the reactions that I showed you before, and I know that there are very few chemists here in the lecture, so you don't have to remember all these, all these reactions, so we switch and go now for the modeling of CVD. Now, all the CVD processes that I described to you before can be modeled very simply, in a very, I would call it a unified way to model CVD, and it's, you can, if you, you can use it the following, in the following. First, you have to decide desired vapor pressures of the chemical constituents. Uh, you have high for the reaction transported into the reactor, and high for the product eliminated from the reactor, and, this, and low for the desired remaining products. This is a typical system, and the common for LPC for most of the systems. Now, the energy... You can have the energy from many sources. You have chemical energy, if it's a spontaneous reaction. You can have thermal energy if you heat the system, or plasma discharge, or electromagnetic radiation, UV, visible, or microwave. And then you have nucleation and film growth is a homogeneous, if you have nucleation in the gas phase, to be avoided. We don't want it. Or heterogeneous nucleation on the, surf, on the substrate to be desired. CVD is often usually performed near to thermodynamic equilibrium, so equilibrium thermodynamics can be applied. It means that most of the reactions in practical processes are not so fast. So we can assume that we are working near equilibrium, so we, are, we, are not, we don't have to take care of some very crazy uh, transients or situation. So mostly we work near equilibrium. Now, 
we also have some reaction kinetics. Equilibrium, or the thermodynamics, is the part which is described the reaction. But we also have some, some uh, kinetic limits. We have the diffusion of the reactants to the surface. We have the adsorption, the rate of adsorption. And the rate of adsorption, if you, it depends. It's, uh, there are a few models to describe adsorption. The most common is the Langmuir model. But adsorption, if you think about it, if you're not, don't think like a chemist. Think about it. You have a, an area, and you're shooting atoms on the surface. The atoms will hit the surface here. The second atom will arrive here. The third one will arrive here. Now, the rate of adsorption, if you shoot more atoms, suddenly the amount of empty spaces is going down. So the rate of adsorption depends on how many sites you have in the beginning minus how many sites are occupied. So you, this is the basic assumption of adsorption, that the rate of adsorption is like, depends on the number of free sites on the surface. So you have some kinetics involved. Some, uh, so the adsorption itself involves some kinetic mechanism. The surface events, like how many uh, reactions you have per unit area, or surface diffusion. <coughs> now, uh, you have to understand, most of the CVD processes occur at temperature which are relatively low. 400, 450, 250, 600, 700. And this temperature, there is no volume reaction. No volume diffusion, sorry. Only reaction, only, only diffusion on the surface. Which means... If I have a material, sorry, if I have a material, this is the surface, and this is the bulk, and an atom arrives and reaches the surface, there is no diffusion of this atom into the bulk. The temperature is too low. But this atom can travel right and left. So you can have diffusion on the surface and this is two dimensional diffusion this is not one, this is not diffusion in three dimensions but it can go on x axis or y axis so this is called surface diffusion which means the adsorption which is not you still don't when the molecule reaches the surface you have adsorption there is still no chemical reaction so it's a kind of a physical adsorption but once you have the reaction you can you have a stable uh, chemical compound, a stable reaction, you have the atoms at the surface, which is very stable, and there is no more diffusion. And then the next atom is coming and diffusing and stays here. Another atom is coming. Another atom can come here. Another atom can come here. Another one can come here. And suddenly, you build a cluster of atoms. This is a nucleus. This is a small nucleus. And the nucleus is growing and growing and growing. You also have the absorption of the products, and you have diffusion of the products. All these steps are responsible for the kinetic limits. But there's other factors. The other factor is that we are depositing from the gas phase. Now, when we deposit from the gas phase, we have to also understand the aerodynamics in the system. The aerodynamics, which means to understand the flow of the ambient, the flow of the gas in the chamber. And now this is like, uh, I know that most of you didn't study aerodynamics at all, but you all understand the basic of thermodynamics. When you drive a car, you take your hand out of the car, and you feel the air, and you can rotate your hand, and you, you know that if you do this experiment, but very carefully, and you notice that next to the surface, the air speed is lower. Away from the surface, the air speed is higher. And this is because of the viscosity of the air. The air is viscous. And because the air is viscous, when you have a flow of air, initially, these are the, these are the speed. The arrow here represents the speed of the air. And this is your wafer, or the plate. plate. And 
and we flow air to the chamber, and the air is usually come here. The air is the the, the flow of the air is uniform. Oh, the gas or yeah, the gas. The gas is silent. The hydrogen, whatever gas I'm using in the system. Yes. So this is the wafer. This is the case when the gas is parallel to the wafer. We have few options. We can have the gas flowing parallel to the wafer, or we can have the gas flowing in this way, over the wafer. Either way, we have a flow. It's much easier for me to describe this mechanism, because this is easier to solve. This is very simple to solve. It's more complicated to solve a structure. We have flow in this dimension, because some of the lines can... You have some flow lines inside, and the air is stagnant between the wafers. The comment is here is that we have two possible systems. That's a very good comment. One comment is that we keep the wafer like here, and the air is flowing in parallel to the wafer. If you do this, you find out that the airspeed here is slowing down. It's slowing down because of friction with the surface. And if the air is what we call a Newtonian, Newtonian fluid, or ideal Newtonian fluid, then ideally the airspeed near the surface will be zero. And by the way, if you have a tube, then actually you develop here some uh, speed of the air, which is with some kind of parabolic shape. Here it's very slow, faster, 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 slower, slower, and much slower. So tube, not the development of a parabolic velocity profile. Now, consider a plug flow geometry which impinging on a flat surface. The boundary condition on the plate surface will be that uh, we have here, uh, the explanation of this mechanism is that we are generating here what we call a boundary layer. Near the surface of the wafer, we generate a boundary layer. And this boundary layer is here you have the volume of the reactor, and near the surface you have an area which is the velocity of the air is going down from a certain speed to almost zero. And the reactants has to diffuse from here through this layer to the surface. This boundary layer is the area of the, is the volume of the surface, of the volume near the surface. It means that if this is your wafer, and the air is flowing, you have here, we can model it as a boundary layer. And this is the gas. And the gas is diffusing through the boundary layer. Because here we have all the gas with a lot of volume of the gas. And in order for the gas to reach the wafer, it has to cross the boundary layer. Now, we assume that here the gas is flowing, there's a lot of gas, and here on the surface we have the reaction. So this is a classical model to model a chemical vapor deposition. Now, if you remember, when we discussed oxidation, we also assumed that there is some boundary layer, but I did not include it into the calculation. What, when we discussed oxidation, I told you there is a certain concentration on the gas, and on the surface is lower. This is what I told you. I didn't go into details of the modeling. But in a vacuum system, in an LPCVD system, system, I need to model it because the thickness of the boundary layer depends on the pressure. And the way it depends on the pressure is the following. And we can have the second way. Second way is to have the gas is flowing like this way. Gas is coming from the center, the wafer is here. Typically, the wafer is rotating. And the reason you want it to rotate, you want to make a symmetrical, symmetrical deposition. And what happens, the air is coming from the top and it's flowing. Uh, by the way, what is the velocity here in the center? Zero. And then it's flowing, this is like a stagnant point at the center. Or the lateral, it's symmetrical, so it's... Zero. Then we have uh, some flow here, and then the speed, oops, the speed is going down at the edge of the wafer. So this is the pedestal reactor, and this is the re reaction flow. Questions? What happens if you have a pattern? Usually you have patterns of structures in the wafer. 
It's a very good question because now we have a scaling problem. The scaling problem, what is the size of this boundary layer relative to the size of the patterns of the wafer? Usually, if we assume that if the patterns are much, much smaller than the boundary layer, then we can neglect the effect of the patterns. However, if we go to certain situation that the, suddenly this and this are of the same dimensions, then we cannot assume anymore that this is a flat layer. You don't see it much in air. In air, typically, the boundary layer is higher. You can see it in liquids, in liquids, in plating. You mean not air, you mean gases? You don't see it in, so when I say air, I mean gas. It's, you don't see it much in gases. You're right, same comments as you said before. In gases, it's diff usually the boundary layer is few microns to a few hundred microns, but you can see it in liquids. If you do, because the, see, the same uh, mechanism, the same model that I showed you now for gases, you can apply it with liquids. And from liquid phase deposition, it was used very much in the past. Now people use it less and less. <laughs> Questions? A grown grain? A shallow water in a stone or something? I mean, if, if you grow here an island of a small nuclei, if, if the, nu the nuclei are a few angstrom, a few hundred angstrom, they are much smaller than the boundary layer. So we don't see it. It's like, a, imagine like a huge wave in the sea and the effect of a small snail or a small pebble. It's very small. This is, it's a scaling issue. It's a scaling problem. Now, to give you some explanation, and again, and I don't want to go through all the mathematics, how to calculate boundary layers, and I want to give you some basic facts of the mechanism which involves this. We already have enough, enough aerodynamic today for the rest of the semester. We can assume that the diffusion of the gas from the volume to the surface follows fixed slope, which means diffusivity times the gradient. The amount of atoms that arrive to the surface per unit area depends on the diffusion coefficient times dc over dy. Here we have a lot of atoms, here we have less, so we have a gradient. Now what is this gradient? You can approximately is the concentration of the gas minus concentration of the surface divided by delta, and delta is the boundary layer thickness. And the boundary layer thickness depends on the speed of the gas, but also on the pressure. So we call if the D over delta, we call it Hg, or the mass transfer rate constant, which says that the flux to the surface of atoms is proportional to the differ difference between how many atoms we have in the gas minus how many atoms we have on the surface. Now, on the surface, we have less atoms because atoms on the surface are reacting, so they are, the number is less. They are reacting, and we have less atoms. Solid. Solid is much denser than gas. Yeah, but this is, on, this is concentration in the gas in the bulk, and this is concentration in the gas near the surface. This is concentration of the gas right next to the surface. Now, what else? There will also be a reaction flux, the rate of depletion of reactants, molecules per unit area consumed. We are consuming molecules in the surface because they are reacting and they disappear, or they become something else. This flux, F2, is equal to the concentration. If we assume a first-order reaction, is Ks times Cs. Now, in a normal situation, F2 equal F1. So F1, Ag, Cg, minus Cs, equal Ks, Cs. So if it, this equal to this, we find out that Cs equal Ag, Ks, plus Ag, plus Ks, times Cg. So it looks to me a very trivial calculation. Now, if you have electrical engineers in the house, this term, it reminds you of what? It's like two capacitance in series. 
This is like a, either a parallel combination of resistors or a serial combination of capacitors. But if you think about it, the smallest one is the one that determines the, the rate. This is a connecting two, two, connecting two steps in parallel. First, diffusion. Second, surface reaction. And the slowest one is the one that determines the rate. Now, this is very, very, very important conclusion because now, since I know CS, I can calculate the growth rate. Because what is the growth rate? It is F2. F2 is how many atoms arrive to the surface per unit area. So this is the growth rate. And the growth rate is e proportional to F2, which is proportional to CS. Because what is CS? CS is how many atoms we have at, next to the surface. And we already assumed that this is the first order reaction, that the deposition rate F2 proportional to CS. So we found out that the deposition rate is proportional to AG times KS divided by HE plus KS. So now, now, once we have this very simple expression, we need to study what is KS and what is AG. What are, how, they, how do they depend on temperature? How do they depend on pressure? Is this clear? Uh, this is, it, it looks simple, but it's very deep. It's something which is fundamental to all CVD processes, all of them, that I showed you before. Oxidation, reduction, compound formation, everything. This is a very general expression. And it leads to some very, very important conclusions. So you can calculate, for example, the deposition rate, because if I know the flux, I can calculate our deposition rate, which is, I just, uh, uh, I take, the, this is how many atoms per unit area per unit time, divided by N is the number density of atoms, how many atoms we have per unit volume, so uh, this is 1 over a centimeter cube per time, the, times centimeter uh, cube here, this is a centimeter square per time. This is a centimeter cube, we got centimeter per second. Right? If this is one over centimeter cube, this is one over centimeter. I, I have to remember if I, f ah, okay, sorry, I have to look at the units, but if I, let's check. F2, ah, I, I do the calculation here, F2 is equal centimeter per, per square per second. So Ks times Cs is centimeter minus 3, so Ks is centimeter per second minus 1. So this is the unit of Ks. So what is the unit of Ks? The unit of Ks is centimeter per second. So the unit of uh, Ks is also unit of speed, which is centimeter per second. And the unit of H is, is also the same unit centimeter per second. Uh, the mass transport rate constant, they have the same units as speed. Let's, let's check it here. I hope you can do the calculation correctly. But if F1 is 1 over centimeter square per second, and Hg here, the unit, it's uh, 1 over centimeter cube, we got that the unit of Hg is also centimeter per second also units of velocity. This is just because the way I choose the units. This is the definitions. So Hg has the units of velocity, and Ks also has the units of velocity, which actually makes sense, because we add Hg plus Ks. And if they were different units, then I would be in very, different, very deep trouble. And Cg is 1 over centimeter cube, and N is the number density of atoms here. Once we have this unit, we got R in the units of centimeter per second. Then, what else? R units are centimeter per second. It's the growth velocity or the growth rate of the above expression. So, we have this expression for the growth rate. And now, let's look at Hg and Ks. What are they exactly? Let me remind you that Ks is the reaction rate constant is a parameter which describes the reaction rate. While Hg was diffusion coefficient divided by delta. This is dg. So Ks 
is a normal reaction constant. A normal reaction constant in many reactions are like Ks0 E minus over delta E over Kt. Typical reaction rates for, them for uh, typical chemical reactions depends exponentially with temperature. This is known. You increase the temperature, you increase the reaction rate. And typical, most common chemical reactions obey this rule that the reaction rate depends on the temperature by a simple erroneous description. The, the reaction rate depends on the temperature like E minus delta E over Kt, and delta E is the free energy of, or the enthalpy of this reaction. AG is more complicated because we have to remember some what we studied in high school about kinetic theory of gases. We have to remember how delta depends on the pressure and how dg depends on the pressure. But something very interesting here. Diffusivity depends on the pressure, but diffusivity depends very... the dependence of diffusivity on the velocity on the temperature is very, very, is not strong. It's very, it's very weak dependence. It's not exponential. It's algebraic. It depends on the temperature, like to very, not like an exponent. So dependence of diffusivity on the temperature is not so high. Delta also does not depend much on temperature. So what you find out that Hg is not so much dependent on the temperature while the, the Ks is a very strong function of temperature. Now, remember, the position rate is Ag times Ks and Ag plus Ks. So if Ks is a strong function of temperature and Ag is not a strong function of temperature, we can have some, just by controlling the temperature, we can go from reaction limited rate situation to transport. Now, we prefer to work in reaction rate limiting situation. We don't want to be in a situation where we have a strong function of transport. Why? Because, you have any idea? Why we don't want to work in a situation where we are transport limited? Yeah, maybe have less control of uh, the process. Exactly, because if you work, for example, here, if you are limited by the transport, the transport here is different than here, than here, because here we have Delta, the boundary layer is different. The velocity is different. So if we are working in a situation we are limited by the mass transport in the gas, most probably we will get a non-uniform coating. Because the deposition will be a function of the velocity of the air, of the geometry of the chamber, where the pump is, where I inject. But if I work in a situation where I'm limited by the surface temperature only, and if I manage to control the temperature of the wafer very accurately, then I will get very accurate deposition and very uniform deposition. So this is the key to CVD. The key to CVD is that to remember that R, the deposition rate, is Hg, which is the mass transport factor in the gas times Ks, divided by Hg plus Ks, times the concentration of the gas divided by N, and N is kind of a constant, depends on how many atoms are here per unit volume. So, if Hg is larger than Ks, which means Ks is small, Hg is high, which means we have high transport in the volume and low reaction rate. So, we are limited by the surface reaction rate. In this situation, the growth rate is a function of Ks times Cg. Look at here. If Ag is bigger than Ks, then if Ag is bigger than Ks, I can eliminate Ks. But then I can divide Hg. And then the deposition rate will be proportional to Cg times Ks, which means depends only on Ks. And Ks depends on the temperature. So my deposition will be as good as my temperature control. If I can control the temperature to be very, very uniform of the wafer, I will have very uniform deposition. I, I'm, I'm independent of the geometry of the chamber, of the flow, of the pump, of everything else. But this is what I want. I want to get very uniform deposition. However, if I am working at lower temperature, 
at higher temperatures, sorry, when Ks is very large. This is at low temperature, because at low temperature Ks is low. As I increase the temperature, Ks is become faster and faster and faster. Then, if Ks is very large, I can neglect Ag, divide by Ks, and then the growth rate depends on Hg times Cg, but Hg depends on the diffusion coefficient divided by delta, the boundary layer thickness. And the boundary layer thickness depends on the geometry of the chamber, on the speed of the wafer, on the geometry of the flow. I can get some strange effects on the wafer. Definitely not a uniform coating. Now, if you look at R as a function of 1 over T, this is low temperature. At low temperature, we get a very strong dependence on the temperature because at low temperature, we have a, Ks is very slow. Ks is small. So at low temperature, we have a very strong dependence. And this is a growth rate R. And typically, this is, this is plotted in, one, in like a, this is a log scale versus 1 over T. And so in a log scale versus 1 over t, we will get a straight line. And this straight line, the slope of the straight line, gives me the energy of this reaction, the, 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 the energy which is uh, described in this equation. However, when I increase the temperature, at a certain point, suddenly Hg becomes smaller than Ks. And what you find here, that... In this area, the deposition rate is a very weak function of temperature. So what we usually do, we design the processes to be in this region, not here. So at high temperature, the growth rate is usually diffusion control. Mass transport in the gas phase is very sensitive to pressure. Listen, as the pressure is going down, the diffusivity is going up. And the diffusivity is responsible for Hg. And because the diffusivity is going up very rapidly, the actual deposition rate is going up. We have less molecule per unit area, but it's, it's you see, Hg is going up, and Cg is going down. The question, which is going down, if the going down of Hg is more or less than the increase of the diffusivity. So let's do a little more calculation. Now, a very, very simple calculation of the thickness of the boundary layer. And if you have some, I really don't want to go too much aerodynamics, but I really have to give you some basic equation. The thickness of the boundary layer is proportional to the viscosity of the air x, which is the size of the wafer, divided by the density of the, uh, of the, of the gas, by, and divided by the velocity of the gas. And this is, by the way, called the Reynolds number. This is the dimensionless number. The Reynolds number is actually rho times u times the dimension of the wafer divided by eta, the viscosity. Now, what usually delta is a function of the distance. Because in, if you remember, when the air is flowing over the wafer, initially the velocity here is high. But as we progress, the velocity is going down because of the friction. So you can calculate some average delta, which is integral of delta, delta x of 1 over uh, divided by the dimension of the wafer. So if you do this mathematics, you find out that the average boundary layer is proportional to one over a number that we call a Reynolds number. And this Reynolds number depends on rho, which is the concentration in the gas, the velocity L divided by the viscosity. Now, if you do the calculation, you find out the diffusivity in the gas is one over the pressure. As the pressure is going down, the diffusivity is going up. And it's proportional to uh, 1 over the pressure. Now, Hg is dg over delta S. 
Now, if you do the calculation, for example, if we go from uh, uh, atmospheric pressure to one to, to one tor, one tor is uh, uh, okay. Atmospheric pressure systems have major drawbacks. It operates at high temperature. A horizontal configuration must be used. Few wafers at a time. It operates at low temperature. Another, another uh, explanation. Another. Uh, problem that I did not describe to you before is that sometimes you need to have many wafers in the same chamber to save money. So a very common configuration is to have a tube and in the tube you put like a kind of a cantilever holding the wafer and put the wafers on this tube and they are like this side by side. Like in a dishwasher, exactly. Now, the air is flowing in this dimension. Oh, it's not, not the air, so the gas is flowing in this dimension. So, the gas, to reach the center of the wafer, the gas has to go by diffusion. So, you want to increase the diffusion length. You want to increase the diffusivity. Because in this case, the gas is flowing here, and it, from here to here, the gas is traveling by diffusion. So you want to increase the diffusivity. The one way to increase the diffusivity is to lower the pressure, because the diffusivity is proportional to 1 over the pressure. Now, Delta S dependence is more complicated on the, on the pressure. For example, if I go from, from a normal pressure, normal pressure is 760 tors, and let's go to 1 tor, which is, uh, we call it low pressure. So if we go from, uh, one, from, room, from ambient pressure to 760, we, let's do this calculation, we go... This is one atmosphere, and this is one tor. One atmosphere is 760 tor, by the way. Tor, it's T, sorry, this tor. Now, if we go, we look at the diffusivity. If we go to one tor, the diffusivity is going up by a factor of 760. Because the pressure is going down by a factor of 760. Now, if we calculate delta, we find out that delta is, inc delta is increasing. Why delta is increasing? Because delta depends on 1 over the Reynolds number square. But the Reynolds number depends on rho, the concentration, divided by the viscosity. So when the pressure is going down, the concentration is going down, but also the viscosity is going down. If you calculate the exact modeling, you find out that delta is going up by a factor of 7. I'm not giving you the exact equations, just the phenom phenomenological equation. The actual equation is much more complicated. By the way, you can estimate it, if you want to know more, uh, the viscosity dependence on the pressure is similar to the diffusivity. Anybody here study aerodynamics? If you remember Stokes' law, there are some rules that are connecting viscosity and diffusivity. They are connected. They are not independent. So what you find out that if I, maybe I should bring you a better expression, but delta, when the pressure is going down, delta is going up, but as the pressure to a very weak function. And if you do the exact modeling, you find out that it's only going down by a factor of seven. So the transport factor, which is dg over delta S, is going up by a factor of 100. What does it mean? It means that if, at ambient, at, at, if we look at this expression, rate versus 1 over temperature, or ln over the rate, it's like this function. 
Ks, this is dominated by Ks, and this is dominated by Hg. If I lower the pressure, I increase Hg. So now, the curve is shifting to here. And I can work at much higher temperature. So I can get much higher deposition rate with the same quality. So the reasons to work at low pressure are first, I can work in a much higher transport rate because the transport rate is going up. The transport rate is going up because two effects. One effect is that the diffusivity is going up as the pressure is going down. And the reason is because uh, the pressure is going down, the distance between the molecules are larger and the distance between the collisions is larger. The mean free passes become larger. You have to remember the, the basic kinetic theory of gases, that what you have is molecules in the gas which are colliding with each other. And if, if I increase the pressure, I increase the distance between the molecules. They, they have less collisions. They travel at larger distance. If I lower the pressure, sorry, if I lower, sorry, if I lower the pressure, I increase the distance between the collision. I increase, I increase the mean free pass. And then I increase the diffusivity. In the same time, when I reduce the pressure, when the pressure is going down, delta, the boundary layer, is growing. But it's not growing much. It's growing, like in this case, it's growing by a factor of seven. The transport of reactions from the gas phase to the surface through the boundary layer is no longer a limiting factor. So if you look at this expression, this is the equation. This is the position rate for atmospheric pressure. For the same reaction, if I work at 760, this will be the curve. If I work at one tor, this will be the curve. So Because Hg is going up by a factor of 100. So now, I, instead of working here, I can work here. And I can get much higher deposition rate. If I want. I don't have to, but if I want. Uh, it's, 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 uh, 1 over T. 1 over T. 1 over T. 1 over temperature. So this is low temperature. This is high temperature. As I increase the temperature, Ks is going up, going up, going up. And here, I become limited by the transport in the gas. And as I increase the temperature here, uh, again I become limited. So this is the difference by APCVD and LPCVD. Questions? This is the. I, I don't want to. I don't want to be much higher than this. I want the KS to be the constant. Yes, I want to. I want to work in a regime when the KS is the dominant factor, because then I can guarantee a good uniform coating. Now. Here's a little bit more equations, a, a, a little better uh, with low pressure and high gas velocity due to pumping. Uh, let's say we work at one tor. D is 1 over P. So if we go from 760 to 1 T, it's going up by about a factor of 1,000. I mean, uh, it's actually going by a factor of 760, but it's approximately a factor of 1,000. Delta is the viscosity divided by rho VL, which is square root. This is going up by a factor of 1,000 because the viscosity is actually going like the, the diffusivity. It's very similar. But the density is going down, the velocity is going up, and if you do the calculation, here I got a factor of 3. Previously, I got a factor of 7, so you have to understand that expressions I'm giving you are a little bit approximated. <coughs> But the bottom line is the Ag is going up, in this case, by a factor of 300. I took it from two different references. But in the previous calculation here, it went up by a factor of 100. Here, it went up by a factor of 300. But both are approximations. So this is the, the, the position rate. We have the surface reaction limited, low temperature. And we have the gas transport limited, which is the high and we prefer to work here. Okay, so I think we'll, it's seven and five, and the next step is to talk a little more about 
I did, I, I, so far, I, did, I, just, I talked about the uh, transport and the macro effects on the, the level. Let's talk now about the growth itself and some examples. When we discuss film growth, there are a few possibilities. One possibility is that we have an island growth. We call it the Vollmer-Weber island growth. It's the smallest stable cluster nucleate and grow in three dimensions. Here we got the three-dimensional growth. And this happens when you have a low surface mobility and typically many metals and insulators. You can also have a layer growth. So one layer, second layer, third layer. This is uh, Frank van der Merve layer by layer growth. It's the smallest stable cluster nucleate and grow in two dimensions. Atoms of the deposit are more strongly bound and where is the mouse? I lost the mouse. Here is it. And you can also have the Stransky um, Krastanov way, which is basically a combination of a layer growth and an island growth. So these are the three possible uh, topography that you can find. Now, let's start with epitaxial growth. The epitaxial growth is uh, the formation of a single crystal material on a single crystal substrate. Epi means on, taxial is on the same axis. Typical reaction for silicon, very common for silicon. People use it a lot because today most of the wafers that we start are epitaxial wafers. Silicon tetrachloride plus hydrogen forms silicon plus HCl. HCl is going out, silicon is going down. And by doing this technology, you can take a, a substrate which is very heavily doped and deposit on the substrate layer with, for example, you can take a silicon, a silicon substrate which is heavily doped, high concentration, and put on top of it a low dope. Low doping. So you can grow silicon on silicon. And this is typically what the many wafers uh, are being used today. And the reason, by the way, that you want a substrate with very heavy doping is to reduce lecha, to reduce... Uh, very, the, in, uh, if, you, if you didn't take electronic circuits in the past, some of you are not from electrical engineering, but when you build integrated circuits, there is a problem which is called lechap. It's a situation where because of the resistivity of the substrate, if there's a transistor here, if there's a transistor here, and another here, and for some reason there's a current flowing into the substrate, there is a potential drop between the two sides, and under certain circumstances, this potential drop is a big problem. So to one, the best way to, Im to remove this effect is to increase the doping level of the substrate, which means reduce the resistivity of the substrate, make it better conductor. The best, and the way to do it is to take a heavily doped substrate, but you cannot make transistors on heavy dop silicon. So on top of it, you build a low doping silicon to the level that you want to use. So this is typical epitaxial process. And a typical epitaxial process, and this is a, a typical epitaxial process, is using silicon chlor SiCl4 gas plus hydrogen, which forms silicon and HCl. Now, what you find out that silicon solid plus silicon chlor4, you also have etching processes. So, you, uh, if you take this reaction, Si chlor4 plus um, hydrogen, you are reacting between these two gases and you form silicon and HCl. Now, HCl etches the silicon. So, you have the position and etching in the same time, which is, by the way, one of the reasons which helps this process. Because you have continuously the position of the film on the substrate and partly etching. And if you typical, if you look at this reaction, the mole fraction of SiCl4 
divided by SiCl4 plus hydrogen, if you increase the concentration of this small fraction, you find out that you have in initially when you increase this fraction, because if you look at this number, if you look at very low numbers, the concentration of hydrogen is much larger than SiCl4. When this concentration is much larger, you can assume that you don't have this fraction. So what happens? Initially, when you increase the concentration of CiCl4, you increase the deposition rate because you have more silicon Cl4 in the reaction. But as you increase the concentration of silicon chlor 4, you also increase the amount of HCl that you are forming. So what happens if you increase it at certain level, you start to have deposition and etching, and if you go above 25% approximately, the etch rate is faster than the position rate. So what you actually happen, you etch the silicon, you don't grow. So this is a typical uh, industry growth condition about in the range of 1-2% mixture of SiCl4 and hydrogen. The temperature is pretty high, look at the value. 1270 degrees. It's usually people do it at very high temperature. To achieve a, a reasonable uh, growth rate, it's, you don't want to work at low temperature because you want a high throughput process. You want to work at the fast. And uh, look at the values here. You can go, this is typical, like two microns per minute, which means in one or two minutes you can finish the whole wafer. You don't need more than a few microns. For this, uh, because you you need this layer only for the transistors. You don't want it to be, and the transistor thickness is few hundred angstrom. So this is typical uh, industry growth conditions for typical, and this is example of a process where you have in the same time deposition and etching. I I didn't teach you etching. I'm going to teach you etching in the next lecture, oh sorry, in two weeks, but etching. Modeling of etching is exactly like modeling of the position, just the opposite. We have transport mechanism, we have adsorption, but instead of growing, we have etching. All the other modeling and the boundary layer and everything is exactly the same. Now, the epitaxial growth of silicon typically is uh, in the range of 1,000, 1,100. So you have a silicon substrate, and then you have the interface, and then you have the layer on top of it. And you, you, you introduce dopants as you wish. So in the gas phase, you introduce uh, silicon in the gas phase, but you also introduce phosphorus or arsenic or boron, depends on the doping that you need. And what you grow, you grow it epitaxially. The, it's uh, the lattice constant of the top layer is exactly as the bottom, so you grow it one layer, second layer, third layer, and it's growing in a very uniform uh, structure. Now, what happens if you introduce germanium into the substrate? Actually, this, uh, what I'm going to show you, is also true for compound semiconductors, gallium arsenide, gallium indium arsenide, for many other compounds, but I, I I prefer to explain it to you for silicon germanium because it's a simpler system. When you grow a germanium silicon, germanium is a larger atom, also with a larger lattice constant of the germanium. So when you have a germanium silicon, and germanium silicon can be a semiconductor, it's a compound semiconductor. But what happens if you grow germanium silicon on silicon? And this is very common today because germanium silicon has many good properties and it's being used for uh, 45, 32, and nanoscale VLSI circuits. So what happens is if this is alpha S, this is, al this is the lattice constant of the silicon, this is alpha F, the lattice constant of the film, it is AS and AF, we have what we call a mismatch. And this mismatch causes, when I put the first layer, you see what happens. I take this structure, 
and I have to fit this structure onto this structure. So like taking the structure and you have to compress it. You take the structure and you compress it. So when you compress the structure, you generate non-uniform stress. You have a, the, the stress in the lateral dimension causes some expansion in the vertical dimension. So what you have, what happens, the silicon germanium on top will become like this. So we have a strained layer. And this strained layer, the lattice constant of the silicon germanium in this dimension will be the same as the silicon in the bottom. And it's like a spring. If you take a spring and you push it, the spring wants to go back. And you generate internal stress inside the film. Now what happens if for some reason, you know, like any spring, if you give it the situation, it will expand. What happens? It's possible that instead of having this ordered structure, this structure will some... Uh, this uh, lattice will not, meet, will not match the lattice of this structure. So this is called uh, unstrained. This structure is grow, can grow epitaxially, but it's unstrained, and we have here misfit dislocation. This is a dislocation. It's a defect on the surface. Now these defects are electrically active. They can affect the properties of the semiconductor. This layer is called relaxed, because there is not much internal stress. And this layer is called strained. Now strains are very important today because it was found out that the mobility in strained silicon can be very high. And it has very good properties. So this is a very common device. So this is a strain in epi layer can be relaxed by misfit dislocations. This is the dislocation, this is a defect, which ends here. You see this is a defect because here we have a lattice, here we have a lattice, and here we have some defect, which means the lattice is some the periodicity of the lattice is disturbed. Now, the sorry. This is what I'm explaining to you now. Usually, if you work very carefully, the initial layers are strained. You deposit the first layer, and it's strain, the second layer, the third layer. But you build an energy, a mechanical energy into the system. So if you reach some thickness of the layer, what happens, the energy wants to go to a lower level. So what happens, at, there's some critical thickness that above it, you start to grow, uh, you break the uh, condition and you're not growing any more a strained layer. Because the material prefer to grow a relaxed layer with a lot of misfit dislocations. No, it's not, it's not, there's some critical thickness. For very low thickness, for very thin layers, most likely, I mean, you can always have a bad deposition conditions, but if you know what you're doing and you work right, on very thin layers, you will have a very uniform strained layer. If you reach a thickness, a critical thickness, then you will start to have a lot of dislocations because then you lower the energy of the system. Because building this mechanical energy every layer, you increase and increase the energy of the system. So once, and by the way, it's also possible that you grow it unstrained, uh, sorry, you, you grow it strained, and then it relaxes. You, you suddenly, you got some, the defects are formed as you grow. Depends on the temperature. The critical thing is depends on the temperature, the thickness, and the misfit itself. Depends how, man, how many germanium atoms you have in the silicon. Question. No. Uh, if you below the critical thickness, it could stay for a long time like this. There is some critical thickness above it. It can relax or not. Can be in some quasi-static situation, or if you below critical thickness, then you can stay for a long time. But yes, how does it affect the energy gap? The it affects the energy gap. It affects the energy gap because of the strain. You change the energy energy band structure of the of, of the. 
you basically you, gener- you, you, you definitely change the energy gap, the, uh, the shape of the energy levels, you change the uh, it's complicated, it's very complicated because it's if you have some in silicon in, in silicon for example this is in the, if you plot the this is E, e versus K you apply pressure, you actually change you, you, you change the shape of the valley here. Uh, sil- don't forget silicon, the band gap is between uh, this is k equals zero, and this is some k, and this is the band gap for silicon. So you change the mobility of the electrons, you change the mobility of the holes. The holes in silicon are more complicated. you have heavy holes and light holes, and you can Generally speaking, by compressive stress, you improve the mobility of the holes, but tensile stress, you improve the mobility of electrons. This is what I showed in the first slide in the lecture, that for NMOS devices, I apply a tensile stress, and for P-type devices, I apply a compressive stress. And the germanium doesn't lower the heat? Ah, this is, this is only on silicon. Now, germanium is a direct, is, is a different uh, band structure, and the, the germanium itself, the germanium itself lowered the band gap of the semiconductor. The more the silicon band gap is like 1.1 1. 1. 1 something electron volt, germanium is about 0. 0.7, 0. 0.6 something. So the more germanium you put into the silicon, you lower the band gap. But you get this strain only when you combine silicon with germanium. Yes. But you can deposit germanium and silicon directly. But then you have a problem with too much, too much strain. But see, see what happens. Before that, I showed you the position of silicon, germanium, and silicon. But I can do the opposite. I can deposit silicon on silicon, germanium. So if in this structure, I generate a compressive stress, if I deposit silicon on silicon, germanium, I deposit a tensile stress. It's pulling the layer. And here, you see the structure, or like here, this is now, this is like, if this is like ideally, or not exactly, because silicon is FCC, but if it was a cubic structure, here it's ideal cube, here it's not an ideal cube, it's more like a rectangular cube. And it's strained. And by the way, the mobility of the electrons in this dimension is different than in this dimension. From the physics point of view, it's a lot of fun. And it's a very interesting phenomena that you can look, you can find now. And this is um, uh, something uh, that people are doing in silicon for the last few years, investigating. By the way, everything I showed you now, it's for large infinite layers. But now think that you take this structure and make it nanoscale. Then you can have some other quantum effect in this strain silicon. And this is what people study today. There's a lot of new things that are being evolved now in silicon technology based on this. Yes? No, no. Epitaxy is a kind of CVD. But in epitaxial growth, the growth is very ordered. Because I have a template on the bottom. It's like you have like a, an area to start, and then you put the atom, each one, on its place. So it's a CVD. It's a chemical vapor deposition. It's a deposition from the gas phase, but it's ordered. That's why we call it epitaxy. How do you make it ordered? You have to start with an ordered substrate. Epitaxy is always when you grow on an ordered substrate. You need to have an ordered substrate. And CVD is the general term. CVD is the general term. You have CVD, it can be epitaxy, can be APCVD, all the, all the CVD that I showed you. CVD is a very general name. Any deposition from the gas phase is called CVD. And epitaxy is from the gas phase, so it's CVD. But it's epitaxial, which means it's growing like a crystal. Now this is how it looks. This is a silicon substrate. And this is what people usually do today. They grow on the silicon S- silicon germanium. 
Now, the way they do it, they grow it relatively thick. So it's much above the critical thickness. So you have a lot of misfit dislocations there. But then you continue to grow, continue to grow, continue to grow. So what happens if you continue to grow? Uh, here you have a lot of dislocations, but if you grow and grow and grow and grow, you have here on the top of it a relaxed layer, because you are far away from the dislocations. So this is what you find today. You have a silicon substrate, and then you have a compositionally relaxed silicon germanium. This is relaxed silicon germanium. And on top of the silicon germanium, you grow silicon. And this silicon is trained. And then you can get the very fast transistors. This is what I would say. This is a cross-section uh, TEM of the entire strained silicon substrate structure with a close-up of the strained silicon. This is how it looks. This is the relaxed silicon germanium. And this is the strained silicon on top of it. So to get a strained silicon, you first take a silicon substrate, grow silicon germanium on top of it, so initially you have a lot of dislocations because you grow it very thick. If you grow it very thick, then you have a lot of elastic energy inside, so it basically breaks, but if you continue to grow, continue to grow, suddenly you go away from the damaged layer and you start to grow a relaxed silicon germanium without defects. On top of it, you build the silicon, which is now strained and very useful for devices. And this silicon, you make it very thin, because you don't want it to be thick. You, do, you, you see, you want the silicon, you want this layer, the strained silicon, to be not much larger than the inversion layer of the transistor. Because this is where you have the mobility, the mobile electron, the surface mobile electrons. You want to make it uh, not much, it's like a quantum well uh, of, the, of the inversion layer, but not much more than this. So you can... Yes. And you don't have dislocations in this frame? No. Silicon? If you're doing it well, the, all the dislocations are here, and they disappear. Because here, you start to grow thicker and thicker and thicker, and this is relaxed silicon germanium. It's relaxed. Because, but here, you have a lot of dislocations. But, the but, but this is the lattice dimension of silicon germanium. Yeah, but then when you grow the... Silicon, it's strained. It's strained. This is how you grow strained silicon. This, what I'm showing you, this is what today is the common technology to grow strain silicon. You don't just take silicon germanium wafer, and the reason is because you cannot buy them, but it's very easy to get good quality silicon <coughs> substrate. And we know to deposit silicon germanium. So we deposit silicon germanium, grow it thick enough to get rid of all the dislocations, then you have a relaxed silicon germanium, and on top of it you grow the silicon layer. Uh, do you know, have a, a lot of dislocations here, a lot of dislocations, but they are getting less and less and less as you go up because. Why are there new dislocations between the silicon germanium? Ah, because it's very thin. This one you grow very thin, below the critical thickness. Because uh, remember, you build a layer, you build a strain. You build another layer, it's strained. So you have an energy. Every layer you have more and more energy. And if the energy, the total energy has become too large, then it relaxes. Then you generate these locations which are reducing the energy. So you have a critical thickness. If you grow this layer of strained silicon below the critical thickness, then you are safe. Now, I'm, I brought you some real pictures of um, various effects. For example, uh, this is copper CVD. And this is a picture of just that did some deposition and stopped. To show you, for example, the initial stage I told you about islands, the nucleation site. This is how it looks in the very early stage of deposition. And by the way, this is a surface which are not clean. This is clean with argon. This is clean with hydrogen. But initially, this is how it looks. It really looks like nuclei, small nuclei, which are sitting each and here, here and there. And then they grow and grow and grow, and then we have a uniform layer. So this is the deposition before coalescence. This is the position before we had full coverage of the layer, just to demonstrate you the effect of a nucleation. Uh, for another uh, method is growing the, the nucleation depends on everything, depends on cleaning of the surface. 
depends on the type of the surface. This is copper on tungsten, this is copper on platinum, this is copper on copper. And this is, uh, this is after 5 minutes, 200 degrees Celsius. So basically they did some deposition and stopped it. And what you find out that the size of the nuclei and the size of the island depends on the subject. That's, uh, that's, uh, watch and enjoy. This is nothing to, don't, nothing to write, but this is just to show nucleation. And this is, uh, uh, depends on the precursor. This is uh, two type of compounds. This is like one compound. This is the second compound. So you can, in, 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 this is with additives. This is, I didn't, what I, what I missed in the lecture, I didn't tell you that you inject the gases, but sometimes you inject some other gases, which we call additives, which have effect on the surface of the, surf, of, of, of the substrate. So this is, this is large islands, this is small islands. So one important issue is this, you, we grow the film, and then we have the microstructure. The microstructure is very important because we can have a micro, we can have epitaxial films, which are the perfect structures, but we can have like platelets and whiskers and dendrites and coarse grain polycrystalline, fine grain polycrystalline, amorphous, and in the worst case, it's God's face powder. This we really, this is really what we don't want to have. But we can get all this now. What is uh, dendrites. Dendrite is sometimes, as I showed you before, imagine that we grow the film, we have islands, but the islands have the very specific property that the material prefers to grow on the island than on the bottom. So we, we can grow like this. The material will grow like this because of some energy considerations, the position here is preferred. Just for example, in some deposition in liquids, here the electric field is stronger. Or in some deposition in metals, the position here is a higher energy than the position here because the metal uh, has a strong affinity to other metals. Uh, lead, for example, tin, some soft metals tend to grow the, the metal like itself. So it prefers to, the metal prefers to grow on the metal than to grow on the glass. This is on a glass. So this is called dendritic. It's actually, if you look at it, it looks like a forest of uh, needles. This is a, by the way, this is usually we don't like it. It's kind of a, not a good process, but there are some applications for this, like making capacitors. If you want to make a device with very, very large areas, if you want to have a, a, some, a, a, we sometimes intentionally grow forests of, of, of uh, Platinum. Uh, it's very common to use this platinum. It has a very special name because if you look at this forest of metal, how does what what will be the color of this metal? It depends on the spaces. No, the no. It's, it, this is the, the distance is a few nanometers. What, what will be the color of this metal? Depends on the size. Of the... I tell you, it's not depend on the size. Why depends on the surface? Black, black. Black because it's so rough. It's so rough. So every you illuminate it, the light will go everywhere. So what happens? It's called platinum black. It's very common material for catalysis. It's very common material for catalysis because it has, it has a huge surface area, and people use it for catalysis. Catalysis. Uh, Catalysator. Catalysis uh, for like br uh, br in your car. You know this catalyst catalytic converter in your car, for example. It's a huge surface area, and it's catalytic. The palladium in your car, you, a, you all have in your car catalytic converter. I'm not sure they make it with this technique. It's too expensive, but same principle. Now, it can, it, it can, it can have whiskers. Whiskers is a, uh, I would say it's also, I would call a pathological situation, but a whisker is sometimes you deposit a layer, and suddenly you have something like this. It's for some reason, some local stress. You have some, some situations. It's also, this is common in soft metals. You don't find it in hard metals. It's common in soft metals. You, uh, you suddenly, you, uh, if you have too much strain in the structure, it's like, you know, if you hold a toothpaste and you press the tube, 
suddenly, if you have too much stress in this dimension, this dimension, sometimes soft metals can, the, the stress can be relaxed by growing these whiskers. It, it's, you don't see it in VLSI, you don't see it in our business, but if you work with soft metals, you can see it. Yes? Actually, it's a nanowires, uh, but I, you see, we we made bio, we we made nanowires before the people called them nanowires. <laughs> I first my I made my first nanowire 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but we called them nanoscale wires, not nanowires. How yeah. How do you avoid this situation? Oh, excellent questions. You have to understand, and I'm not, I'm not teaching in this class, I have to understand the mechanism of dendrite growth and to, not to work under conditions of that effect. You have to understand whisker growth or uh, platelet growth. Platelets is when you have, instead of whiskers or needles, it becomes like layer structure. Uh, a combination of experience and understanding the mechanisms, but... Uh, I'm not going into too much details how each one of these uh, situations is actually happening. It depends on the temperature, depends on the gas, depends on the growth rate, on the substrate, and additives. Now, generally, generally, if you, were, if you deposit at very low temperature, the structure will be amorphous. If you deposit at very low temperature, most likely you will grow an amorphous layer. If you increase the temperature, then you will have very, very small grains. You increase the temperature further, you will have a polycrystalline film. It will be with many, many, many small crystals. Further, increasing the temperature, you will have a coarse grain, large grains. And very, very high temperature, you will have a single crystal. So epitaxial growth usually at high temperature. And amorphous deposition is typically at low temperature. And fine grain in this type of a granular structure will be in intermediate temperatures. Now, the precursor uh, supersaturation, which is basically how the concentration in the gas phase, also affects the deposition rate, but I will not go into this, but the, the temperature effect is most more import, important for us. Now, just to show you some, for example, very common material that we use for gate, it's polysilicon. And this is polysilicon deposited on SiH4, so from SiH4 on oxide. This is the position at 650 degrees, and this is uh, at lower temperature, so the, the, the temperature, this is, uh, so this is 625, this is 600. So at low temperature, 600 degrees, the polysilicon is almost amorphous. It's very difficult. This is a TEM picture. This is a, sorry, this is not TEM, this is, uh, no, this is, I'm not sure, I think this is an SCM picture or high resolution. What you see here at, very, at low temperature, 600, it's amorphous, completely amorphous. If you grow at 650, it became crystalline, but it's very interesting, the crystalline are columnar. Are, this looks like needles that you pack them together. This is very, this is very uh, unique to uh, polysilicon. This is when you grow it at 650. Now, this is where after growing, you can change. This is a cross section. This is a cross section. This is from the cross section and looking from the sides. And as a silicon, polysilicon at 650 typically grow columnar. This structure is not the best structure. So typically we anneal it at 700 or 800, and then each one of these columns is a single crystal. So what we usually do, we heat it up to 750 or 800, and they all coalesce and generate much larger crystals together. This is what we do during annealing. And... Um, Uh, there was, by the way, uh, before we go, in the slides I gave you, there's some repetition of the slides, so we actually now jump 
more slides ahead. In the next lecture, we're going to uh, finish the topic of CVD. I'm going to give you some examples, and then we continue with PVD.